people often walk in their own unique way. Some might walk with a bit more arm swing, while others might add that extra swag. These variations in walking are nothing to be too concerned about, but there are certain specific gaits that we need to pick up and recognize, as there is often an underlying pathological cause. The three abnormal gaits that we will discuss today include the short leg gait, the Trendelenburg gait, and the antalgic gait. To understand these types of gaits fully, we must first understand the normal process of walking. The action of moving your foot whilst walking is divided up into two phases, the stance and the swing phase. Stance phase occurs when your foot is in contact with the ground. The initial contact that the foot, and more specifically the heel, makes with the ground is known as heel strike. The hip is level at this point and the limb is preparing to take the weight of the body. The knee is slightly flexed or extended. From here, you shift your weight onto your flat foot, over which the entire weight of your limb is evenly distributed. Here, your anti-gravity muscles come into play. These include your glutes, quads, gastrocnemius, and soleus. In the final stages of the stance phase, the weight on the foot moves forward as your ankle plantar flexes. The knee is fully extended. This will take you into the swing phase. During the initial swing phase, the ankle remains plantar flexed, while the knee and hip flexors start to work to bring the foot in front of you. During the mid-swing phase, the toes and ankle need to dorsiflex to ensure that your foot is cleared from the ground. And finally, in the terminal swing phase, while the hip continues to flex and the knee reaches its maximum extension, the hamstrings fire to prevent you from swinging your leg out too far. In the short leg gait, the patient might walk with an abductor lurch or lateral shift on the affected side during the stance phase, resulting in a limp. To properly assess for this gait, you should look at the patient's shoulders. The shoulders will move down when stepping on the short leg and up when stepping on the longer leg. If you pick up this gait, you should always follow up with a measure of leg length. The causes of a short leg gait can be divided up into congenital and acquired causes. Some of the congenital causes include developmental dysplasia of the hip, congenital short femur, proximal femoral focal deficiency, bowing of the tibia, congenital hemiatrophy, or congenital hemihypertrophy. Some of the acquired causes include paralytic, as in the case of poliomyelitis, or due to physial damage, which can either be by trauma or infection, or overgrowth of one leg, resulting in a leg length discrepancy, and this can be due to chronic osteitis. The Trendelenburg gait is due to functionally weak hip abductor muscles, namely the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. The function of these muscles is to support the opposite pelvis and prevent it from drooping excessively during the normal single limb stance. As a result of weakness of these muscles, during the stance phase of gait, the pelvis tilts away from the affected side. In an attempt to lessen this effect, the patient will lean over the affected hip to compensate. This will bring the center of gravity over the hip and thus reduce the degree of pelvic drop. This gait is best observed by looking at the patient's shoulders. Some of the causes of this type of gait include developmental dysplasia of the hip, leg calf pervious disease, slipped upper femoral epiphysis, or due to neuromuscular weakness like in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Pain in the hip can also result in a Trendelenburg gait. The antalgic gait is adopted when a limb is painful so as to avoid bearing too much weight on that limb for too long. The stance phase on the affected side is shorter than that on the normal leg as the patient tries to move the weight off from the affected leg as fast as possible. This means that the swing phase of the normal leg is decreased. Assess this type of gait by observing the stance phase of each leg. The causes of an antalgic gait will vary with age, but some examples include congenital defects, fractures of the tibia or foot, infections such as osteomyelitis or septic arthritis, arthritis in the leg joints, or benign or malignant tumors in the lower limb. We have now covered the three must-recognize gaits in orthopedics. There are other types of gaits that are also important to recognize, but will not be discussed here. These include the ataxic gait, the steppage gait, the hemiplegic gait, the scissoring gait, and the flail gait.